Um, I work in IBM's Smart Cities team, um, but I'm going to try and talk to you without using too much jargon or marketing language about what I think are really exciting and important trends affecting the world at large, actually. Um, we talk about them in terms of cities because that's where the activity of the world is most concentrated. Um, so let me, without further ado, find page down. Um, I'm going to start by talking about my four-year-old son. Um, if I'm lucky, by the time I die, he'll be about the age that I am now. If I could look ahead and see him then, and the way he interacts with his world as it will be then, I would struggle to understand his behaviour as human behaviour. Um, the reason for that is what I think of as the disappearance of the boundary between the human and physical world and information systems that's taking place at the moment. Starting point for this is two years ago, I bought an iPad. I showed my then two-year-old son a video on the iPad. I think it was Thomas the Tank Engine. At the end of it, he touched the thumbnail of the cartoon that he wanted to watch next. That's before he can read and write. He's using one of the most advanced innovations in user interface technology I've seen in my lifetime to access globally sourced media. The way he interacts with his world, having grown up from such an early age with that ability, will be astonishing, and it will be augmented by the incredible changes that we're going to see that will make the touchscreen look like a prehistoric artifact relatively soon. So let me show you some uh, examples. Um, the top left of the corner of, of the screen there, you can see an IBM computer called Watson, which two years ago now, played against human contestants in a television general knowledge quiz show. So it was asked and answered general knowledge questions in human language um, and its source of information for answering them was human understandable knowledge. It had access to Wikipedia and the Internet Movie Database, a couple of other things. The two humans you see there are uh, multi-millionaires who've never worked a day in their life at a traditional job because they're so successful at playing television quiz shows and winning money. And you can see from the score there that the computer was rather better than they were at doing this. This is not artificial intelligence, but it's a demonstration of the ability of computers to process information of the same sort that human beings understand. We're now using it to help um, clinicians um, access research literature when diagnosing conditions such as diabetes and cancer. There are 50,000 research papers published in diabetes in English every year and no clinician can keep up with them. This is a fantastic tool for helping them. The top right um, is the reason I used the phrase ghost and machine in the title of this. The ghostly image you see on the right has been captured um, from an MRI scanner measuring someone's thoughts as they watch the film on the left. So this is mind reading an image um, using a computer, um, using a magnetic resonance imaging scanner. Um, if you um, Google Popsi mind reading, you'll find the story about this and how it was done. It's real science and technology and it's two years old. Um, World of Warcraft is up there because the size of the economy in um, v trading virtual objects in 3D computer games is now the same size as the economy of Malta. It was the same size as the economy of Iceland before Iceland went into recession. Um, and this moth here is, for me, one of the most challenging th um, examples. This moth has had control technology implanted in its muscles and it's being flown by remote control, literally with two little levers like this. This was not an IBM piece of work, it's not one I'm particularly comfortable about, it's an example of what's possible. And for me, the economic implications of this are encapsulated in this, which is a 3D printed prosthetic limb. So this is something that has been digitally designed to the specific physical requirements of a patient. It's then been um, visibly designed by an artist to the patient's individual um, personal preference, and then it's been printed out on a relatively general purpose manufacturing machine. Um, this sort of thing can be done in the space of a couple of days now. Um, right there you have an artifact that combines digital technology, the manufacturing industry, healthcare, and creative art in one object. Um, we've seen convergence over the past 10 years between communications, IT, and media. This is an example of the sort of convergence we're going to see driven by the disappearance of this boundary between the information world and physical systems. All of these examples are real and they're actually a couple of years old. The world's going to change at an astonishing rate. And we need some new ideas. We face, I think, some incredible challenges in our, in our cities. Um, 
From the Industrial Revolution, we built the centre of cities upwards around lifts powered by a steam engine. For the past hundred years or so, we've built them outwards around the car. Um, I think we've only been able to afford to do that because the social and, and environmental cost of that lifestyle aren't included in the financial price. And as the world's emerging economy goes through explosive growth and the number of people with the financial wealth to afford that lifestyle explodes over the next five to ten years, um, that illusion is going to be shattered pretty rapidly. I think the reason we're all paying more for our food and for our energy and for our heat as a proportion of income over the past few years is a consequence of this competition for global resources. It's not to do with a local recession in the UK. Um, I'm going to take you next through some examples of cities that are using some of these technology capabilities to address those challenges. And, and I think, for me, this is what defines a smart city. A smart city is one that's exploiting these incredible advances in science and technology to address the challenges that we're all facing in our economy in our, and in our cities. And importantly, they're doing it in a way that's sympathetic to us as human beings and as communities. Um, one of the other um, examples of science um, that I have included so far is the ability to grow artificial meat in laboratories and actually the ability to print living skin and muscle tissue one cell at a time. This can also be done now and one of the reasons people are looking at doing that is to solve the challenge of how we feed a rapidly growing world population um, meat. Now, is that the way that we would like our society to develop? I think this is a question and a challenge that goes to the heart of our understanding of what it means to be human and our relationship with the, the world around us. Um, and so that's why I think this issue of being sympathetic to our needs as people and human beings is important. So I think three ideas um, help me to understand this, and they come not just from technology, but also from research into resilient systems and for, from urbanism. And the first of these is for little things and big things to, to work constructively together. Top left of, of this screen is starting to give some, some physical examples. The top left here is um, Mass House Circus in Birmingham, the ring road that was constructed around the city core after the Second World War. It was obvious that the city's economy needed for traffic to be able to circulate around the city core, but it wasn't sympathetic with the need for people and individuals to cross it and interact transact you know, the meaning of a city economy. Um, and as a consequence, you can see outside the ring road, this wasteland that's used for parking without even bothering to build a multi-storey car park because the, the barrier of this ring road makes that land so economically um, unvaluable. And by contrast, this pedestrian roundabout uh, in China has transformed what used to be a frighteningly busy city junction that drove people away, maybe a little bit like Silicon Roundabout here in London, um, into a destination where people con congregate in the evening because the structure is such an interesting one to walk around. You're probably all familiar with Exhibition Road in, in London, um, maybe not so familiar with the East Side City Park, which is part of a transformation of a very challenged part of Birmingham's sort of outer city core, um, which again has transformed our ability to walk from the city centre and the railway stations to the Science Museum and some of the important incubation facilities. So for me, these are big infrastructures, but they're sympathetic to the needs of little people um, to, to transact and interact in a city. Um, we are physically little, but we're the most important things in a city. It's, it's why it's there. So I think there's a very important idea to get right. The same challenge applies to technology infrastructures. We talked just a little bit about some of the things we can do with technology in a city. It's possible to put instrumentation on just about anything you might imagine right now. And that means that we can measure some very interesting things. We can measure where individual cars and buses are or the level of carbon monoxide or other gases in the atmosphere. We can turn that data into information about city systems, um, the level of congestion and speed of traffic flow or the um, carbon emissions of, of buildings. And we can turn that information into insight about a city's performance, the impact of congestion on economic productivity or the impact of environmental quality on life expectancy. These are amazing things to be able to do and do them dynamically in real time. And as a consequence, cities are rushing to deploy broadband infrastructure and 3G and 4G connectivity to allow this data to flow everywhere throughout the city. But this data is no use and this connectivity is no use if, you're a, if uh, you can't afford a connection to a broadband subscriber or if you're a business that doesn't have access to computer programming skills to manipulate all this data and information. So these information infrastructures, whilst they have tremendously exciting potential, have the challenge of being the big infrastructures of the information age. And to my mind, we need to make them adaptable to the interests of individual people, communities and business to be able to use them productively. When we do that, 
we can do some incredible things. The top left of this screen here shows uh, Singapore's traffic system, and the green and red colour coding is showing a prediction one hour in advance of traffic speed and traffic flow in Singapore. It's proven to be about 85% accurate, and we've done it in a number of cities and road systems around the world now. So we know where we can tell when congestion is going to occur before it happens. And one of the things we can do is give that information back to traffic managers so they can take decisions about traffic light phasing and lane priorities and try and prevent it occurring. But this picture on the right is a much more interesting idea. It's admittedly a rather old-fashioned smartphone application now, but what it's doing is very interesting. It's from a pilot project with commuters in San Francisco, and every day each commuter in the um, pilot is sent a message before they're going to set off for their daily commute, telling them how long their journey that will take that day based on a prediction of congestion that will occur after they leave the house. That means if congestion is going to be a problem, they've got a new opportunity to make an informed choice, not to travel, to travel at a different time, to take a different route or mode. So it's appealing to a personal um, motivation to change behaviour to improve the performance of a city. And we can appeal not just to individual motivations, but to a sense of community and place. Um, this is a smart water metering project in a city called Dubuque in Iowa. What it's doing is taking information from a water meter in a household, and Dubuque's rolled these out across all the households and businesses in the city, and it's analysing the information from that meter. Fairly obviously it can tell you about water usage throughout the day and how that varies, but it can get down to a much more granular level, and when you have information about water and energy usage, you can identify patterns that tell you that washing machines are being used on high temperatures or are working inefficiently because they haven't been serviced. Or beneath this, these large variations, you can pick out a slow trend that indicates there's a leak somewhere in the water supply. And when you give this information back to people, to a certain extent, they choose to change their behaviour based on it. But what was really interesting in Dubuque was when we gave them this uh, information in the top right-hand corner of the screen, this Greenpoint score. That's a comparison of this household's water usage with an anonymised aggregate of their near neighbours. And people given this information in Dubuque were literally twice as likely to change their behaviour to improve their water usage as people who weren't given, given it. Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells us that once our personal um, physical safety is taken care of, we care next about our relationships and perception by people around us, and this is appealing to that. But this needs very careful design back to um, the the need to not just deploy big infrastructures, but to deploy them in ways that's sympathetic to people and communities. I gave this presentation at EcoBuild earlier this year and was followed by um, Ian Short from the Institute for Sustainability. And he told the audience about a project that had used precisely this technique, but to try to improve people's recycling performance. But what happened in that project was people who were told that they were better recyclers from their neighbours reacted by saying, um, well, if no one else is trying, I'm not going to bother either. So it had the reverse effect. Um, so these things need to be very carefully designed in context and not just transplanted from one place to another. One of the places we're exploring doing that is in, is in Dublin, um, where the, the city has built a partnership between the city authority, the local um, county councils, um, the National University of Ireland and service providers in the city. And they're now sharing about 3,000 sets of data about Dublin city systems. But they're not just making it available to researchers from the university and to some researchers from IBM, they're making it available to the city's communities, to its innovators and its entrepreneurs. And the picture you see over on the left here is some of the, the apps that those communities have developed to use Dublin city data in new ways to provide people with information how to get about the city, etc. And some of those apps are now being developed as commercial applications by new businesses who are winning venture capital investment because the apps they're developing based on Dublin's data can be resold in other cities worldwide. I'm going to move swiftly on rather than take up too much time. So that's little things and big things working together and starting to use information about cities. The, the next theme is born from the idea that that information is about us all the time and we don't only use it, we create it. Whenever we move about with a smartphone, the GPS sensor in this creates data about movement in a city. Whenever we share a photograph on Facebook, we're creating digital media. Um, and this, the, the rise of social media in 2007 meant that in that one year, more new information was recorded than in the previous 5,000 years combined because we all got smartphones and we all got broadband in the developed world. It's an astonishing growth in information.
And that's what's led to YouTube being a medium of choice for, for video information rather than traditional television channels. So we're all producers and consumers of information. But what that disappearance of the boundary between in the information world and physical systems means is we can all be producers and consumers of many more things than information. So some examples, and effectively what these are, is are information-based marketplaces. Um, ever since human beings settled down and started farming, we've had a diversified economy in which we produce and consume things. What information technology means is it's now much easier to directly connect producers and consumers of goods and services um, at the instant in which they have the possibility to perform a transaction. You can dramatically shortcut um, traditional supply chains um, in doing so. As an example, um, these images here are taken from Shapeways, who are a company who will 3D print pretty much any object that um, you can send them a design for. And communities have now grown up to design and share the designs for objects and then have them printed out using Shapeways. So this is dramatically simplifying the value chain of the manufacturing industry. Um, surprisingly, one of the um, areas that's been transformed most quickly is this, uh, this one, model railways. If you model railways, you've always had to invest in a set of tools to build models. Rather than do that, many railway modelers now are investing in 3D printers or purchasing 3D printing capacity from organisations like Shapeways and sharing designs of the models that they want to produce. So again, it's changing the nature of that industry. The top left is the Hell's Kitchen Farm Project in New York, one of many examples of local food growing initiatives in cities. And one of the things that's starting to appear now in... Um, companies such as Big Barn and Sustination and Casserole are information markets that enable the consumers of food and the producers of food and the processors of food in local networks to make contact with each other more directly. Um, so it's increasing the impact of local food a local food industry can have on the diet of a city as a whole. Transport resources are an, another interesting one. Making big policy changes or invest in infrastructure investments in transport is difficult. Using information to more intelligently use the transport network you have can be much simpler. Um, the Carbon Voyage here in London, using an information market space to connect journeys that need to be made with empty return journeys in vans that are being made anyway to better use the transport capacity of the city. And there are online marketplaces where you can rent a parking space from someone who's got a house and a drive-in in London and doesn't need the drive to park their car during the day. One of the things that I think is a really exciting possibility but that's not actually happening yet, it's what I've got my eye on, is the um, possibility to apply the idea of local currency to some of those marketplaces. So the, the Weir Bank here um, in Switzerland is an alternative currency that's been operating since the 1930s um, where the basis of debt isn't always repayment in, in currency, it can be repayment in kind by individually negotiated agreement. It was set up um, following the, uh, the depression in the 1930s by businessmen who were finding that the banks weren't loaning to small businesses so they started lending to each other and it's thought to have contributed to economic stability in Switzerland for the last 80 years or so. Bristol last year became the fifth UK town or city to start its own currency operated by a social enterprise with the motivation of increasing regional economic trading um, and the local multiplier. Um, and increasingly these systems are using advanced technology like the droplet smartphone payment scheme that started in Birmingham a couple of years ago and launched here in London just a, a month or so ago. Um, operates like a credit card but its transaction fee is much, much lower so it can be used in very different ways. So. To my mind, there's a possibility to use these electronic local currencies to, to alter the rate of transaction in these marketplaces and to create a rate of transaction that um, compares the complete social, environmental, economic cost of a good or service with its dynamic value in context to the person who wants to acquire it. It's a very different thing than a fixed price. Um, one of the things that throws up, though, is, is a challenge to cities. All these new ideas and the possibility to, to maximise local interactions and this convergence between industry sectors is a challenge to the way that cities are structured physically. These photographs of Birmingham are, are placed on the screen roughly where they are in location on the city. Top left is the jewellery quarter where we have highly advanced manufacturing capability. Top right is Birmingham Science Park Aston, the main technology incubation um, centre for entrepreneurs and small business. Um, over on the right here is the Science Museum and Millennium Point. Bottom right is the custard factory in Digbeth where embarrassing bodies life from the clinic is made and the, cr the creative industry has its heart. And over on the left here is University of Birmingham which has great capacity in healthcare technology and healthcare research. 
All these other pictures you see here are the physical interventions in Birmingham. I mean, it's not very easy to walk around between those areas. We've got the four-lane Great Charles Street, Queensway. We've got the four-lane Jenard Street. We've got the disused manufacturing space in Digbeth, all as barriers to people walking between these areas. And in the centre of the city where the finance district is, where people who know how to create investments in new ideas, um, you've got a shopping centre that was developed through a huge programme that rented all of its space to national chains. So there's a dearth of independent cafes and restaurants where people would naturally accumulate. Many of our cities have these challenges, that all of the capacity to exploit the trends that I've talked about is split across different areas of the city, and it's not as easy as it needs to be um, to, to interact between those capabilities. Um, and these are just a couple of um, models of, of Birmingham's connectivity from space syntax, who I'm guessing many of you will, will be familiar with, just re-emphasising that point that whilst it's easy to get in and out of Birmingham centre, it's very difficult to get around this core. And when you stop thinking about cars and start thinking about walking and cycling, it gets even worse. So how can we fix this? And this is where I get to the final idea that I think about, and this is something as natural as storytelling. Um, the reason I come to that is if you consider what it would take to address some of these challenges, um, they're not within the authority or the business model of any single public sector organisation or any single private sector organisation. As an example, around the east side area in Birmingham where the city park is, where they're trying to address some of these challenges, um, you have not only Millennium Point, not only some transport investment, not only some physical investment, but also some really interesting innovations in education that are pulling ch um, students and young people into an area that historically has been very economically inactive. Um, so Aston University's Engineering Academy and Birmingham City University's Ormiston Academy both teach 14 to 19 year old children high value skills through vocational exposure to businesses in Birmingham, either in the engineering industry or in the case of Ormiston in the creative media and digital arts. So they're shortcutting the need to go to university to acquire skills that will be valuable in the economy of the future. And they're doing it in a place. These um, universities are investing heavily in building these new capabilities in the same place. And in the case of Birmingham City University, they're moving their campus several miles in from the outskirts of Birmingham to the centre. So there's a collaboration in Birmingham between a lot of organisations that say we all need to invest in this area for the health of the city, for the health of its economy. Um, and this is, collaboration is a common theme in smart cities at small scale. A lot of it happens in social enterprise. At large scale, it happens as collaborations between city institutions. But to get that to happen, you don't only need the buy-in of the people who operate and lead these institutions. They can't do it unless you have the buy-in of all the people they're accountable to. It means their employees, their shareholders, and the people who elect them. And my view is you can't appeal to that tremendously broad set of people unless you appeal to something very basic, such as a sense of narrative and an ability to empathise. So I'm increasingly not telling stories about the financial benefits of um, smart city ideas. I'm telling stories about people and businesses who've benefited from them and why their lives are better, why their businesses are better. And hopefully that brings me roughly to the end, about on time, to say thank you very much, and I hope that was interesting.